Shut up and sit down. Initially reading this book, I was under the impression that it was a leftist intellectual exposition similar in style to any other sci-fi. But what I found was a manipulative description of a slight variation of communism. Yanis tries to align himself with the leftist feminist movement as an expose into a flat structured equalist society, free from bankers, oligarchs and the share market. He tries to present a utopia where everybody has access to an unlimited trust fund and nobody is motivated to work. The mind boggles how this guy managed to obtain a PhD in economics without grappling with some of the really basic questions, like what is an economy? What is money? What motivates people to work? What would happen if everyone in the world decided to lie flat and just enjoy a drug-fueled existence? To analyse Yanis's belief in a feasibility of a flat structure, we can look at the situation where two parents can have make totally different choices to what they should name their child. One may choose Jack, while the other may choose John. Hopefully you can understand how both parents have a 100% focus on what's in the best interest for their child, but just have a different opinion to what that is. Neither parent is wrong, nor is there a logical or mathematical method to determine what name they should use. The answer is totally subjective. Additionally to this example is Einstein's theory of relativity, which points out that in the end, everything is relative. It's all a shade of grey. Ultimately, every decision we make will have some shade of grey. And for all shades of grey, one person may claim it's black and another person may claim it's white. Neither is right and neither is wrong. But within a group of individuals, only one decision is possible. How can we resolve the conflict? Which parent will get their way in naming the child? Whoever it is will be declared the dominant person within the group. Even a basic flat structure such as a husband and wife, it will fall into this situation. In an economic situation, we can see the inevitable link between ownership and control. That is, whoever controls something is in reality the owner. In a capitalist society, we issue freehold title to declare who the owner is, to point out which person is legally able to make the decisions regarding the property. If that person is the dominant person within a flat structure, then that person is the person who in reality owns the land. Communism inherently means that the dominant people will own everything. Secondly, we need to turn our attention to understanding the concept of investing. If someone doesn't have confidence that they'll still control the land tomorrow, then they won't put any effort into developing the land today. They'll refuse to build a house, a driveway or sow the fields as they will fear that that investment will be stripped away from them sometime in the future. And if the person doesn't have the ability to transfer control to another, then they'll be unable to use that property as security to borrow, undermining that form of investment as well. With this, we start to realise that reality has some cornerstones, like the concept of a free market is a description and not a definition. The Australian description of a free market is inherently different from that of America, because what works in America need not work in Australia. The description of a market is in reality based in what works, and this is unavoidable. The workability requirement is still present in Yanis's corpore syndicism, even if he chooses to ignore it. Whoever dominates will have effective control over property, and those people will have effective ownership no matter what the system is. Yanis also claims that we sure should, should have access to unlimited credit. The mind boggles again. Why would anyone want to work or pay off their debts if they can just borrow more money? Here we need to really talk about the idea of just printing a million dollars for each and every person. If everyone was a millionaire, then who's going to cut your hair? If everyone has a choice between sitting on the beach enjoying cocktails, why would anyone want to cut your hair? You know it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars just to convince someone to cut your hair. At the end of the day, money is just paper with ink on it. But unlike the other paper with ink on it, the money we trust we can exchange for goods and services later on. If people no longer want our paper with ink on it, then we'll have no motivation to give us anything for it. It'll just become like all the other paper with ink on it. It's people's desire for money that underpins its value, and with unlimited credit, it would just disintegrate the entire concept of money. Moving on to Yanis's idea of a citizen jury. 
he seems to understand that without the motivation for money, society still requires certain work to be done in order for it to function. He represents the idea of obligating people to work under the personal threat of imprisonment. His idea of conscription dressed up in the disguise of a jury makes the mind boggle even more. In a society, we still need certain services such as public transport, food production, grocery markets, sewerage and garbage collection. Yanis seems to believe that we should all draw straws into determining who in a flat society will be lumped doing these jobs that nobody really wants to do. And who will decide the metrics? Is there going to be some government bureaucrat who wants to have access to good looking prostitutes and will obligate that one in a hundred women will be compelled into the sex industry? And who'd waste their time investing in themselves studying to become a dentist? Summing up, Yanis's representation of Marxism is beyond the left. It makes no sense that the fringes of both the left and right sides of politics have the unwavering belief in Armageddon. His book has more logical potholes and less scientific basis than the Bible. I kept reading it, expecting that the character would wake up and claim it's all a nightmare, but that outcome never came. The most conciliatory note was in the last sentence of the last chapter, where he concedes his book was madness. On one side, I enjoyed reading the writing of a fellow speed reader. Commas and full stops just slow you down. But on the other side, I would put his book into the same pile as the Book of Mormons, a total work of fiction, and don't waste your time reading it. Honestly, I need half a dozen people to have enough thumbs to thumb down this book. Mm.